So I wanted to make a separate video for the uh, legal piece because I know that it can get um, a lot to have two 10-minute uh, videos and hopefully this won't be 10 minutes, but we will see. I'm going to take my video off now and go through it. So I asked you to look at rightslaw.com. So oh, I already had it open. So you can see that this is um, this is a website that was created for parents, educators, advocates, and attorneys to get accurate, reliable information about special education, education, and advocacy for students or children with disabilities. So you can go through and look at, like for example, the advocacy library, and they have you know advocacy tips from the experts. Um, it's got um, how to use IDEA to improve uh, education for students. So they have different uh, uh, entries and whatnot. Uh, you can actually do a search um, for different topics if you want to. Um, let me see. So I will do manifestation determination. And you can see that rights law comes up, hand, handling a manifestation. So you can, if there's something that you have a question about when it comes to legal issues, then this is a great website to, to use for that. I'm going to go back to the, the first page. And I'm going to also, also going to show you, it's got like special education laws in 2004, books and trainings. So, um, and there's also a special ed advocate that's a free weekly newsletter. Um, and they also go through and talk about um, some of the special education legal news. So one of the big court decisions that came out uh, in March was Andrew uh, versus Douglas County, and they unanimously um, rejected the de minimis standard. Um, and so this one is saying that we, as special educators, have to do more than just the minimum amount. Um, when we are providing services for our students with special needs. So um, uh, this is uh, this was a big case within um, within education. So and you can also see that there is a unanimous decision for Fry versus Napoleon and um, and read about that. So I'll let you kind of go through there. And then there's also some uh, court appeals here, so you can you know be current on on that type of thing. Then you've got uh, the law, so this is IDEA, and then they talk about um, here every student succeeds act. Um, there was something I wanted to show you. Um, Oh, right here, just like we were talking about last night, um, it says guidance on FAPE, IEP goals must be aligned with the grade level state academic content standards. So even if a child is below grade level, the child needs to receive specialized instruction. I, the IEP team needs to develop annual goals to close the gap. So if you read that article, it goes into some of the stuff that I was talking about last night with the fact that, you know, yes, you're, you know, if you're at the um, eighth grade, but you're reading at a second grade level, your goals still need to be written for the eighth grade level, and then the benchmarks can actually get you up there. Um, and that's how you can break it down. So please take a look at this website. And also know, like I said, you can do searches. So let's do a search on FBA. Let's see if it all should come up like that. Um, okay, that, and we'll, we'll write it out this time. <laughs> oh, actually it was at the bottom, wasn't it? Functional behavior analysis and if we go down here you can see rights law has a whole bunch about FBA so there's a lot of information that we can get the other thing that I added was the 90 tips in 120 minutes um, and this is um, the I gave this to you actually in week eight um, and then I asked you to um, continue to look at it so let's see 90 tips and I'm going to open it. Actually, I have it open. There we go. So the big things I want to pull out here, because I know that this has got a lot of pages to it, um, is how to read it. So you can see, I don't like the formatting of it, but I didn't make it, so it's okay. Um, but you can see that first they talk about the child find and identification tips. So 
we actually, as educators, we are legally mandated to uh, find any student with special needs. So you need to know the difference between like 504 and IDEA and Every School Student Succeeds Act. Um, but you also need to know um, how to, what your role is, and then um, how to make sure that you're doing things. So for example, we've talked a lot about response to intervention, and um, you can, uh, response to intervention is what the school site is using to see what supports work with that student. And the parent can request an evaluation anytime and the district has to um, evaluate. So even if you're in the midst of doing RTI or a student success team, if the parent says, I'd like a special ed evaluation, the district has to do that. Um, and let's see, um, we don't wait for that. Um, watch out for any referral red flags and they go through and they talk about these are all the red flags so if you've got concerns about a student then you need to be um, taking those seriously and that's the big idea there but I'd like you to read through those um, so you don't have to wait for the parent to initiate a referral for an evaluation um, there should be continuous progress monitoring and uh, for evaluations and reevaluation tips, um, you can exercise the right to conduct an independent um, evaluation so the families can actually go and get an outside evaluation and bring it to the school. And they can also request that the school district um, do that. Um, they have to use a variety of assessments. We've talked a lot about that. Um, comprehensive evaluations. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. And these are all the, the court cases that go with that. Um, consider results of independent or private evaluations that the, pres the parents bring in. Uh, the parents have the right to request an I, um, in independent education evaluation at the public expense when they disagree with the evaluation completed by or obtained by the school system and respond appropriately to such requests. Um, so this is just keep it going more with that. So now we've got to we've got FAPE. It talks about FAPE and um, compliance as far as when to comply with timelines. Then there's eligibility. So this is how you determine whether a student is eligible. Um, remember that actual disability labels shouldn't matter. It's the eligibility for services and the provisions of FAPE that matter. Um, Do not rely solely on test scores when making eligibility determinations. So that's why we have to look at it from formal and informal, um, formal and informal assessments. Uh, don't limit the definition of educational performance to academic performance when determining whether there is a condition that adversely affects the educational performance, unless you're in the second circuit, which we're not. Um, remember the third prong of determining eligibility, whether the student's condition adversely affects the educational performance to the degree that the student needs special education and related services. Um, you've got to check between a severe emotional disturbance and just being bad. <laughs> Um, don't rely just on medical diagnosis, diagnoses when determining eligibility. Um, there's also IEP development and FAPE, so be aware that the IEP is a centerpiece of IDEA's education delivery system. Um, in other words, it's how you make sure that they're getting a free and appropriate public education. So to meet its substantive ob obligations under IDEA, a school must offer IEP reasonably calculated to enable that this child makes pr progress in light of the child's circumstances. Um, Make sure that you're not appearing like you predetermined the placement or that you're denying the parent of any input during the IEP. So that, that's the beautiful thing about our family involved IEP. Uh, consider keeping drafts of IEPs and notes that reflect changes that were made during the IEP based upon parental input at the IEP meeting. So this is why the um, IEP notes um, are so important and who said what and what changes were made. 
prepare adequately for meetings and avoid predetermination. So we don't we don't decide on everything, but we draft it, we discuss it, we give people an opportunity to think about it and give their input. Um, act reasonably in the response to parental requests to reschedule meetings. Um, so timing and scheduling. So ensure proper attendance is required by school personnel. Uh, we talked about that last night when we were looking at the um, at the people who didn't make it to our mock IEP meetings. So allow parents to bring invitees to the meeting and, uh, and afford them the opportunity to participate, including attorneys. So if an attorney shows up, um, what I've done in the past is I contact the district person who's in charge of my school right away to let them know that there's an attorney. Um, or, and, or an advocate and, you know, if they're not there already, um, and then they can make the decision on what we do. Um, identify that everyone has, uh, that every, identify everyone that has, uh, the parent has invited to participate in the meeting, particularly if they're participating by phone or video conference. And remember that beginning no later than the IEP at age 16, you must have measurable post-secondary goals. Um, around transition. So this is the transition around training, education, employment, and independent living skills. Um, if the student doesn't attend the meeting, then ensure that the student's transition needs and preferences are adequately addressed. So that's the student-led part. So that would be our um, PowerPoint that our students created. So make IEP recommendation decisions based on the individual needs and circumstances of the child and nothing else. Avoid making IEP recommendations and decisions based solely upon cost of service. Use a pro proper process for determining what least restrictive environment is. Avoid being overly specific and including unnecessary details or promises at the IEP. Address appropriately and annually the issues of extended school year service or yeah, extended school year services with uh, the children with disabilities. So remember that's the um, going to basically a summer school program so that they don't lose skills. Um, address behavioral strategies and interventions. Seek assistance um, of and or contract behavioral experts when previous ex uh, uh, efforts to address the behaviors have not been effective. So this is if the FBA and the BIP don't work. And include statements of present levels of performance um, or otherwise ensure that adequate baseline data exists for measuring and showing progress. Include measurable goals in the IP that are linked to present levels of performance and identified challenges. State services are amounts of services with sufficient, sufficient clarity to the IEP. Um, finalize placement recommendations, particularly by the beginning of the school year. You don't want the kid to be waiting for a placement. <laughs> and develop an action plan to ensure the proper implementation of the IEP. So this is what we talked about last night. Who is going to do what to make sure that it's actually happening? And then follow up on that. Remember to inform all service providers of any responsibility they have to implement the IEP and document that this was done. Engage in continuous progress monitoring on the IEP and revise the IEP when expected progress monitoring is not made or goals have been achieved early in the year. So don't recycle annual goals um, where the student isn't really making any sort of progress. Collect appropriate data and with respect to the implementation of the IEP and student progress. Avoid over-reliance on grades to show progress. So the fact that they got an A in the class or an F in the class actually doesn't show you whether they have been working on that goal. Convene an IEP meeting if there's any doubt about the appropriateness or ability to implement the provisions of the IEP. Um, and provide parents with a copy of the IDEA rights at least once per school year. That's the procedural safeguards. Give written uh, prior written notice with respect to any proposal or refusal to initiate or change the identification, evaluation, placement, or provision of FAPE to a child with disability. Um, timely response to any sort of parent requests. Consider the I, uh, IDEA's mediation procedures to resolve complaints. Uh, by either party and of course using due process and convene a resolution um, solution within 15 days of the receipt of due process complaint from a parent. 
um, gather any and all school records when due process is happening. That will happen, by the way. Um, I have had parents that have gotten to due process and then all of a sudden they want every bit of evidence that I have that I was working on these things. Um, don't forget the IDEA stay put provision. Um, so the stay put provision is that you, uh, you don't change the placement um, while you're going through due process or any sort of thing. So this, the kid isn't kicked out of school because the parent's going through due process on something. Remember that parents are entitled to an explanation of their procedural safeguards, but this does not mean that the explanation must be provided at the IEP meeting. So that's the pre-meetings that we talked about before that you can have to go over the procedural safeguards. Um, for discipline, maintain clear and compliant discipline procedures applicable to the students with disabilities. So, um, and adequately train all the disciplinarians. So if you have your student out in the general ed class, you need to make sure that everybody who is working with them is trained on any sort of behavior support plan that you have. Avoid making unilateral changes in placement through the use of suspensions and or removal for disciplinary reasons. Develop alternatives to suspensions that don't constitute a ch change of placement. And be careful when considering uh, whether transportation or is a related service for a disability. Um, it will be important in the areas of discipline. So um, I'm not sure exactly how much uh, transportation uh, supports um, are usually given around here in San Diego, but I know in San Francisco and Oakland that this was one of the related services that um, had a lot of uh, drama in, in those areas because of the cost. So. Um, so I know that we went back and forth and so uh, really looking at this um, and thinking about this and making sure that you're in compliance with what your district um, has decided is important. Keep appropriate and accurate data with respect to the use of suspensions and or disciplinary removals from school. Remember, they have 10 days before you get a manifestation determination. So make appropriate manifestation determination. So it's after 10 days of a suspension, if they're um, getting close, then you want to make sure that you have some meetings to make sure that they're being supported prior to that. Remember that restraint and seclusion are not disciplinary techniques. And look out for those regular uh, ed students who can claim the district should have known that the that they were they had a disability prior to a long term suspension or expulsion, and use the forty five day special circumstances removal provision correctly. You can go through and figure out what that is. Uh, remember that IDEA does not prohibit school personnel from reporting criminal behavior of a disability. Uh, or a disabled student if they would have done so for a non-disabled student under the same circumstances. And remember that truancy is a behavioral issue and should be um, addressed by the IEP team, including a goal. Um, now in the 504 and ADA, appoint and train good, knowledgeable district 504 coordinators and have good and updated um, procedures and train the school personnel on how to, to follow with the, up with them. Um, understand that a student can be disabled under Section 504, but does not need a 504 plan uh, because their needs are being met. And that there's special rules of discipline that apply to students with the 504 plan. Uh, avoid improper exclusion of otherwise qualified disabled students with extracurricular and non-academic activities, including athletics. Um, and be aware that developing an individual health or nursing care plan may not um, suffice by itself um, for the purposes of determining disability and providing services under 504. Um, that learning is not the only major life activity to consider when looking at 504. And that bullying of a student with a disability could constitute a form of discrimination. Um, recognize potential for Section 504 based lawsuits alleging retaliation. There's a lot of court cases on that one. And then there's mental health tips. So avoid the temptation to un un unleash your inner attorney. I love that one. Ditto with your inner judge. judge. And um, also, as human beings, we're inclined to defend ourselves and respond to everything. In many situations, it's prudent to just sit back, breathe, and decide that no response is more effective. More then um, more often not the best response. Um, 
and then no good deed goes unpunished and, and it goes through that. So that brings us through the 90 tips. Um, you can go through and see some of the court cases. I'd like you to be familiar with this by next week. If you have any questions, let me know.